Chapter 2 of Marilyn Manson's book, The Long Hard Road Out of Hell. Quick thanks to the people that said they wanted to hear more. This is for you. Chapter 2, for those about to rock, we suspend you. Brian Warner was just average. He's always been really skinny like a twig. I would go over to his house and we'd listen to records together. Stuff like Queensryche, Iron Maiden, lots of Judas Priest. I was more into it than he was. I didn't think he really had anything going for him musically, and maybe he doesn't. Maybe he just got lucky. Neil Rubel, Heritage Christian School, class of 1987. Brian Warner and I were in the same class at a Christian school in Canton, Ohio. Both Brian and I rejected the religious pressure of our education quite strongly. He, of course, promotes himself as a Satanist. I've rejected the whole idea of God and Satan, first by becoming an agnostic, and then recently by becoming a witch. Oh, huh, that was a girl. Kelsey Voss, Heritage Christian School, class of 1987. I'd like to ask Marilyn Manson, did I influence you in any way to this lifestyle? I keep thinking, wow, did I do something I should have done differently? Carolyn Cole, former principal, Heritage Christian School. Jerry, I sometimes believe we're heading very fast for Armageddon right now. Ronald Reagan speaking to the Reverend Jerry Falwell. The end of the world didn't come when it was supposed to. I was brainwashed to believe in seminars every Friday at Heritage Christian School that all the signs were there. You will know the beast has risen up out of the ground because there will be heard everywhere a great gnashing of teeth. Miss Price would warn in her sternest, most ominous voice to rows of cowering sixth graders. And everyone, children and parents alike, will suffer. Those that don't receive the mark, the number of his name, will be decapitated before their families and neighbors. At this point, Miss Price would pause dip into her pile of flashcards of the apocalypse and hold up an enlarged photocopy of a UPC symbol, but with the number at the bottom manipulated to read 666. This was how we knew the apocalypse was around the corner. The UPC code was the mark of the beast spoken about in Revelation, we were taught, and the machines being installed in supermarkets to read them would be used to control people's minds. Soon, they warned, this satanic price code would replace money and everyone would have to get the mark of the beast on their hands in order to purchase anything. If you do deny Christ, Miss Price would continue, and take this tattoo on your hand or forehead, you will be allowed to live, but you will have lost eternal, and here she'd hold up a card showing Jesus descending from heaven, life. For other seminars, she had a card with a newspaper clipping detailing John Hinckley Jr.'s then-recent attempt to assassinate Ronald Wilson Reagan. She would hold it up and read from Revelation 13, Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. The fact that there were six letters in Reagan's first, middle, and last names was one more sign that this was our final hour, that the Antichrist was here on earth, and that we must prepare for the coming of Christ and the rapture. My teachers explained all of this, not as if it was an opinion open to interpretation, but as if it were an undeniable fact ordained by the Bible. They didn't need proof, they had faith. And this practically filled them with glee in the anticipation of the coming apocalypse, because they were going to be saved. Dead but in heaven and freed from suffering. It was then that I began having nightmares, nightmares that continue to this day. I was thoroughly terrified by the idea of the end of the world and the Antichrist, so I became obsessed with it, watching movies like The Exorcist and The Omen and reading prophetic books like Centuries by Nostradamus, 1984 by George Orwell. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Nostradamus? and the novelized version of the film, A Thief in the Night, which described very graphically people getting their heads cut off because they hadn't received 666 tattoos on their forehead. Combined with the weekly harangues at Christian school, it all made the apocalypse seem so real, so tangible, so close, that I was constantly haunted by dreams and worries about what would happen if I found out who the Antichrist was. Would I risk my life to save everyone else? What if I already had the mark of the beast somewhere on me, underneath my scalp or on my ass where I couldn't see it? 
What if the Antichrist was me? I was filled with fear and confusion at a time when, even without the influence of Christian school, I was already in turmoil because I was going through puberty. Sure evidence of this is that despite Miss Price's terrifying seminars detailing the world's impending doom, I found something sexy about her. Watching her preside over class like a Siamese cat with her pursed lips, perfectly combed hair, silk blouses, concealing a fuck-me body, and a stick-in-the-ass walk, I could tell there was something alive and human and passionate waiting to burst out of that repressed Christian facade. I hated her for giving me nightmares my entire teenage years, but I think I hated her even more for the wet dreams she inspired. I was an Episcopalian, which is basically diet Catholic. Same great dogma, but now with less rules. And the school was non-denominational, but that didn't stop Miss Price. Sometimes she'd start her Bible class by asking, Are there any Catholics in the room? When no one answered, she'd lay into Catholics and Episcopalians, lecturing us about how they misinterpreted the Bible and were worshiping false idols by praying to the Pope and the Virgin Mary. I would sit there mute and rejected, unsure whether to resent her or my parents for raising me as an Episcopalian. Further personal humiliation came during Friday assemblies when guest speakers would talk about how they had lived as prostitutes, drug addicts, and practitioners of black magic until they found God, chose his righteous path, and were born again. It was like a Satanist's anonymous meeting. When they were done, everyone would bow their heads in prayer. If anyone wasn't born again, the failed pastor leading the seminar would ask them to come on stage and hold hands and be saved. Every time I knew I should have walked up there, but I was too petrified to stand on stage in front of the entire school and too embarrassed to admit that I was morally, spiritually, and religiously behind everybody else. The only place I excelled was the roller skating rink, and even that soon became inextricably linked with the apocalypse. My dream was to become a champion roller skater, and to that end, I nagged my parents into squandering the money they'd been saving for a weekend getaway on professional roller skates that cost over $400. My regular roller skating partner was Lisa, a sickly, perpetually congested girl, but nonetheless, one of my first big crushes. She came from a strict religious family. Her mother was a secretary for Reverend Ernest Angley one of the more notorious televangelist faith healers of the time. Our pseudo-dates after skating practice usually began with making suicides at the rink's soda fountain, discolored combinations of Coke, 7-Up, Sunkist, and root beer, and ended with a trip to Reverend Angley's ultra... Sorry if you guys hear that crashing noise. I'm in the OR. Ultra-opulent church. The Reverend was one of... God damn it. The Reverend was one of the scariest people I'd ever met. His perfectly straight teeth gleamed like bathroom tiles. A toupee sat clumped on top of his head like a hat made from wet hair caught in a bathtub drain. And he always wore a powder blue suit with a mint green tie. Everything about him reeked of artificiality, from his plastic over-manicured appearance to his name, which was supposed to evoke the phrase Ernest Angel. Every week, he called a variety of crippled people to the stage and supposedly healed them in front of millions of TV viewers. He would poke his finger in a deaf person's ear or a blind person's eye, yelling, Evil spirits, come out! Or, Say baby! And then wiggle his finger until the person on stage passed out. His sermons were similar to those at school, with the reverend painting the imminent apocalypse in all its horror, except here there were people screaming, passing out, and speaking in tongues all around me. At one point in the service, everyone would throw money at the stage. It would rain hundreds of quarters, silver dollars, and wadded up dollar bills as the reverend went right on testifying about the firmament and the fury. Along the walls of the church were numbered lithographs he sold, depicting macabre scenes like the four horsemen of the apocalypse riding through a small town not unlike Canton at sunset, leaving a trail of slit throats behind them. The services were three to five hours long, and if I fell asleep, they'd reprimand me and take me to a separate room where they held spe special youth seminars. Here they'd chastise me about a dozen other kids, and about a dozen other kids about sex, drugs, rock, and the material world until we were ready to throw up. 
It was a lot like brainwashing. We'd be tired and they'd purposely not give us any food so that we were hungry and vulnerable. Lisa and her mother were completely devoted to the church, mainly because Lisa was half deaf when she was born, and supposedly the reverend had wiggled his finger in her ear and restored her hearing during a service. Because she was a churchgoer and her daughter had been blessed by a miracle of God, Lisa's mother constantly con condescended to me as if she and her family were better and more righteous. Every time they dropped me off at home after services, I imagined Lisa's mother making her wash her hands because they had touched mine. I was always distressed by the whole experience, but I went to church with them anyway because it was my only chance to be with Lisa outside of the skating rink. Our relationship, however, soon went awry. Occasionally, something will happen that will change your opinion of someone irrevocably, that will shatter the ideal you've built up around a person and force you to see them for the fallible and human creature they really are. This happened when we were heading home after church one day, goofing off in the back seat of her mother's car. <clears throat> Lisa was making fun of how skinny I was, and I put my hand over her mouth to shut her up. As she began to laugh, she spewed a huge wad of thick, lime-green snot into my hand. It didn't seem real, which made it even more revolting. When I pulled away, a long string of it hung between my fingers and her face like apple taffy. Lisa, her mother, and I were all equally horrified and embarrassed. I couldn't get rid of the feeling of her mucus stretched out and webbed between my fingers. In my mind, she had debased herself and shown me her true nature, proven herself to be a monster behind a mask, much like I imagined Reverend Angley to be. She wasn't any better than me, as her mom would have me to believe. I didn't say another word to her, not then or ever. Disillusion had begun to set in at Christian school as well. One day in fourth grade, I brought in a picture that Grandma Wire had taken on an airplane flight from West Virginia to Ohio, and in the photo, there appeared to be an angel in the clouds. It was one of my favorite possessions, and I was excited to share it with my teachers because I still believed everything they taught me about heaven and wanted to show them that my grandmother had seen it. But they said it was a hoax, scolded me, and sent me home for being blasphemous. It was my most honest attempt to fit in with their idea of Christianity, to prove my connection with their beliefs, and I was punished for it. It confirmed what I had already known from the beginning, that I wouldn't be saved like everybody else. I knew it every day when I left for school, trembling with fear that the world would end. I wouldn't go to heaven, and I'd never see my parents again. But after a year passed, then another, then another? Uh, sorry, I lost my place. And the world and Miss Price and Brian Warner and the prostitutes who were born again were still there. I felt cheated and lied to. Gradually, I began to resent Christian school and doubt everything I was told. It became clear that the suffering they were praying to be released from was a suffering they had imposed on themselves, and now us. The beast they lived in fear of was really themselves. It was man, not something mythological, not a demon that was going to destroy man in the end. And this beast had been created out of their fear. The seeds of who I am now had been planted. Fools aren't born, I wrote in my notebook one day during ethics class. They are watered and grown like weeds by institutions such as Christianity. During dinner that night, I confessed it all to my parents. Listen, I explained. I want to go to public school because I don't belong here. Everything I like, they're against. But they wouldn't have any of it. Not because they wanted me to have a religious education, but because they wanted me to have a good one. The public school in our neighborhood, Glen Oak East, sucked. And I was determined to go there. So, rebellion set in. At Christian Heritage School, it didn't take much to rebel. The place was built on rules and conformity. There were strange dress, dress codes. On Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, we had to wear blue pants, a white button-down shirt, and, if we wanted, something red. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, we had to wear dark green pants and either a white or yellow shirt. If our hair touched our ears, it had to be cut. Everything was regimented and ritualistic, and no one was allowed to stand out as better than or different from anyone else. It wasn't very useful preparation for the real world. 
turning all these graduates loose every year with the expectation that life will be fair and everyone will be treated equally. Beginning at age 12, I embarked on an ever-escalating campaign to get kicked out of school. It started, innocently enough, with candy. I've always felt a kinship with Willy Wonka. Even at that age, I could tell that he was a flawed hero, an icon up for the forbidden. The forbidden in this case was chocolate, a metaphor for indulgence in anything you're not supposed to have, be it sex, drugs, alcohol, or pornography. Whenever they showed Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory on the Star Channel, or in our rundown local movie theater, I would watch it obsessively while eating bags and bags of candy. At school, candy and sweets, except for the little Debbie snack cakes on the lunchroom menu, were contraband. So I would go to Ben Franklin's 5 and 10, a neighborhood store that looked like an old soda shop, and load up on Pop Rocks, Zots, Lick'em Sticks, and those pill-like pastel tabs that are glued to white paper and impossible to eat without digesting small shreds of paper as well. Looking back on it, I gravitated toward candies that were the most like drugs. Most of them weren't just sweets, they also produced a chemical reaction. They would fizz in your mouth or make your teeth black. So I became a candy pusher, peddling the stuff during lunchtime for as much as I wanted because no one else had access to sweets during school. I made a fortune, at least $15 in quarters and dimes in the first month. Then someone narked on me. I had to turn in all my candy and the money I had made to the authorities. Unfortunately, I wasn't kicked out of school, just suspended. My, se my second project was a magazine. In the spirit of mad and cracked, it was called Stupid. The mascot was, not unlike myself, a buck-toothed, big-nosed kid with acne who wore a baseball cap. I sold it for 25 cents, which was pure profit, because I copied the pages for free at the carpet barn where my dad worked. The machine was cheap and worn down with an ac acrid, carbon-like odor, and it never failed to smear all six pages of the magazine. In a school starved for smut and dirty jokes, however, stupid quickly caught on until I was busted again. <laughs>